All right. Well, I think uh, I think we're up and going. We got a few people on. Um, we're gonna just give a few seconds here. Uh, we're just share out the page to a few people. Make sure that uh, we got things going. Um, but welcome everyone. Uh, uh, tonight's episode, we're hoping to get a little feedback from the audience, uh, and we'll keep reminding people to love some feedback because uh, tonight is off the cuff, uh, and uh, for at least for me, uh, you know, these guys are always really good at, at doing things off the cuff. I, I, I really enjoy digging in sometimes and seeing what they're doing in boxing and things like that, and that helps me really dig up into topics. But um, I think the good part is Tristan. Tristan kind of has to live this because, you know, he's a teacher, he, he's teaching and coaching martial arts students all the time. Um, and, you know, when you're in that environment, you know, if, if you're trying to run a good club, you still got to keep the doors open and you have to keep people engaged. You have to build them through a period of time in a way that doesn't frustrate them, doesn't bore them. You know, it's, it's a, it's a, there, there's a, there's a space, there's a space in that that's difficult. And I think uh, for somebody that's, you know, making a living or at least trying to keep, a, you know, a club open, um, it's, it's something you have to spend a lot of time on making sure that you get it right. In the SCA, uh, we see people come and go. I think there's probably a lot of people that come and, you know, they, they come expecting one thing. Uh, and then they leave because maybe they don't get it or maybe it took too long. You know, we all heard the stories of I didn't get the swing of sword for my first six months. Um, you know, and and there's no way, right, Tristan, you could ever do that in, in a club. Yeah, it would so, be very hard. So tonight we're going to talk about, you know, recognizing those times. When, you know, when is it time to move somebody along? In fact, when is it time to just even if the person's not getting it, when is the time to move on to something else? You know, there's a lot of cases. And, um, you know, the good part is we're, we're talking coaching and training. But I wanted to make sure everybody remembers this. And that is you ultimately are your own teacher, your own coach, because you are responsible. No matter if you have people helping you, you are ultimately responsible for building who you're going to be. And you should be pulling in a good coach and teacher would say you be, should be pulling in from everybody. You should be watching videos. You should be looking, you should be challenging your coach, you know, or trainer and asking them questions because that only makes you better. In fact, if you have a good coach or trainer, they'll be like, never thought of it that way. Or, Hey, let's try it. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, they want to make sure that you get that experience and you know, tell you the truth, maybe they want to learn. And I think that's super important. Uh, you know, that's that coach teachers, you know, episode we had about being a good student. And and that's all about challenging and 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 working together to be a better, you know, be a better fighter. So so let's jump into um let's jump into the idea of uh you know what it what it takes. How do we recognize the times when when somebody's ready or are not ready to uh to move on so tristan in in your club i mean you know obviously most martial arts have a belt system and there's certain things you have to kind of learn in each belt and then there's testing that goes along that way so there's a much more more formal structure correct yeah there is and um you know whenever we have new students come in the first First thing we do is have back to you know fundamental basics for us it's uh learning to, to become friends around where you can get thrown down without getting hurt um but and you we could kind of look at that like prerequisite knowledge like if, if you want to learn to really to throw somebody you have to learn to be thrown in order to be thrown without getting hurt you better be able to do rolls break falls that sort of thing um and i've seen you know instructors in the sca and uh, coaches and even training groups say, okay, they have kind of a somewhat formalized introduction for new fighters to come in to learn the basics of how to hold your shield, how to hold the sword, how to throw basic blows, how to do some basic footwork. And those are a, a good, that's a good approach to use to kind of get people used to it. Like, okay, what is your starting point going to be? It's good to, to determine that. I mean, I remember back in the day, you know, 
100 years ago when I learned fighting, there was no structure whatsoever. You show up, put on some armor, here, here's a sword, figure it out. You know, no, you're not hitting hard enough, figure out how to hit harder, um, that sort of thing. But if you look at it with even a mildly uh, structured type of perspective, you anybody would realize, okay, before you start teaching advanced concepts, like for example, combinations or combining striking with footwork and defense, you realize there's a certain amount of prerequisite knowledge that's needed. Basics of body mechanics of throwing a shot, basics of footwork and range, understanding what how range basically works. Um, how to even even basics of falling, right? Yeah, exactly. Um, you know, the fundamental rules of our of our sport, you know, what's good target areas, if you consider that, and one of the easiest things to do, and my grandfather was notorious for this, he assumed everybody knew what he knew. So even when they had no idea, uh, you know, he'd say, well, here, you know, go, go fix the car to my, you know, dad and uncle who were nine and 11 years old at the time, they had no idea about working on a car. We have to make sure as, as mentors that we figure out where our student is starting from and give them the thing they need next, which might be just the very first thing. And then how many, how many of us can have challenged ourselves to say, okay, what would the very first thing you would show anybody be? You know, if you're, if you're a decent coach or mentor, you'd have the answer to that question. Like, and then, then why, why, why is that the first thing that you show? And oftentimes it'll be usually, all right, what kind of a stance do you take? Then probably the next thing is how to throw a basic blow. So, you know, at the beginning you have a simple template, but really, if you think about it, that template keeps going through intermediate and advanced where in order to do something somewhat advanced, you, your intermediate fundamentals have to be in place. That prerequisite knowledge has to be to a certain level before you can comprehend more advanced things, um, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I think it makes sense. Um, you know, I'm, and I'm asking a couple of questions out. Uh, whoops, I answered a question in the wrong place. Um, uh, you know, I'm, I'm answering a couple of questions out to our folks watching. And, uh, I mean, Nico just mentioned, she's like, I don't kind of, I don't know how to fall in melee. And I'm like, woo, you know, and, and, and you never think about that, but wow. Mm -hmm. You know, that, that literally, you know, if you're not doing that well, you could, that put you in a scary place, which breaks your confidence down. Right. right. So, you know, all of those things are super important, you know, uh, and, and the question I threw out there was, you know, what do you do for a first person's practice? Right. Mm -hmm. And I think, I think probably everybody has something a little bit different that um, that they do for that first person's practice. I, I think I know for us, I'll, I'll give you an example. And and we I'd like trying to make sure we throw in the hook. And what I mean by hook is most people that come to uh, fight practice. It's about there's a little excitement there. Right. Mm -hmm. So they want to hit something. They want to they they, they want to feel like they can do it. So if we just go through and or just put them in armor or just put put them, you know, on uh, uh, blocking shots or, or doing some of those things, um, you know, it's you, you, you may not be hitting the point that's really grabbing them. So usually for I know it for our practice, I'll usually get them some a, a foam sword and a real fighter and have them go ahead and learn their first blow. And mm -hmm. if that looks good enough and it looks safe to them, in other words, what I mean by that is they're not throwing something that looks like it's going to hurt them. We we tune it just enough to make them feel like, okay, I can throw a blow. And now what we do is we just have them throw it on that person. And then that person will start moving around. So the other person naturally moves around and they get an opportunity to see what the fight is. Really what it is, is that's your adrenaline hook, right? Everybody, that's that's the drug. We 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 inject adrenaline, and they're like, "Oh, this is great! I get to hit people." We didn't even get to the point where they get hit back yet, but you know. And so I, I start a little bit there, and then I see, okay, do you want to learn more? And then, and then you know, then you know, there's a process in in our practice. Some of that process is how you you know is usually and really his his Grace Iliad who helped us out on. I, I kind of stole it from him is a bit of ground up. 
And, you know, we talk about simple rules where you can hit and things like that, right? And the armor you have to wear, wear. We don't get overly worried about that right away because we're all using foam at this point. And we start with the feet and about how you should stand and just help them with some movement. And then we go into, you know, how to throw two, maybe two shots, a head shot and a leg shot. We don't get into real complex shots right away. If they start grabbing those things, then you've got to be ready to move them on a little faster. It doesn't, you know, I'm not going to say, okay, you're going to throw this headshot for the next hour. How many people would stay out of practice, even if you got the chance to do that? Right. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the, the, the trick is later, if you're like, you're going to throw this headshot a hundred times. And that person's like, I think this is going to get me better. But you have to make them believe that this will help them get them better and that they're being watched and somebody's helping them, making sure they're throwing the right technique. And that person will do it. But first, we got to get there. So we get we got to get some some of the, you know, kind of the 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 we got to break that point where we're like, hey, this is going to be fun. So now we can start throwing stuff at you. I, they're, I don't care if a person's perfect right away. Mm -hmm. In fact, most likely we'll never be perfect in the 40, 50 years we have doing it. Uh, and we'll always be trying to do it and we'll be always fixing it. But I, what I care is that they have a good basic. Um, and to, to me, usually, in fact, I tend to try to get a newer fighter um, that I think is appropriate to maybe their age or, or what this person is like. Um, and, and have them work with them because they're closer to the foundational techniques than someone like, you know, Duke Muckety Muck and, and Sir whatever. And those guys are like, okay, this is great. Now let's, you know, now you're going to throw a double up or you're going to, you're going to do this tiny little thing that I just learned, uh, you know, that's going to help you. And it's like, uh, that time you got to, you got to learn a lot before you even understand what that tiny little thing does. Now it doesn't mean you can't start showing people the right techniques. What it means is they don't have to have it perfect. And if you get too into the woods on something, you're going to lose them. They're, they're, they're going to be like, they, they won't have a path because they have no clue where they're going. So, mm -hmm. you know, one piece I suggest usually is out of practice is make sure you kind of most practices, have some fundamental structure to it. Um, not all, but a lot of practices do have a fundamental structure. All agree on what you're gonna, how you're gonna take that first person in that first day. And then, you know, after that, then you should be talking about how should we train this person? Hey, we're gonna have a footwork class, let's do it. You know, um, we talked a lot about other ways to set up a practice and a lot of other our, our episodes, but you know, the closer you have, you know, and this is probably a good thing to write down and I don't have it written down and I'm sitting here thinking, why don't I have that writing then is have a structure on how you're going to train somebody. And, and, you know, Tristan, you, you, you kind of have a structure on how you train people when they first come into your classes, right? Well, and I'll, I'll give you this too. I don't have it written down either. Okay, um, good. Then I don't feel I, bad. I don't feel bad. Uh, but what I do have is a basic template in my mind of, okay, here are certain fundamental skills that need to be uh, covered with people that come in. Now, the one thing, and, and I, as we were setting up this episode, you know, just kind of thinking about, there's two major groups that we're addressing here. And that is um, coaches and mentors in, in trying to identify in a student when they are ready to learn, go to the next step or to learn the next thing or to advance. But then there's also uh, from the student or the fighter themselves when they uh, are taking responsibility for their training and they're like, okay, I should be better than this. I need the next thing and I'm not getting it. Why am I not getting it? Or how do you identify in yourself that you're ready for the next, take the next step? Uh, and that can be a plateau where you feel like you're stuck and you're not advancing. Um, so we're going to try to cover both of those uh, as we go along. But to answer your question, um, one thing that I, I do look for, for example, when I say, okay, tonight we're going to be working on some footwork things and integrating them with technique. And let's say in a class, I've got 
just to use the, the martial art part, I've got some white belts, I've got some blue belts, and I've got you know a brown or black belt with me. Okay, we're all going through the same thing. For one thing, I never split classes into advanced people are doing this over here and beginners are doing that over there. We're all doing the same, working on the same thing, but each one can be working at the level or hopefully just above the level that they're that they are at now. They're trying to get to be a little better. Now, when you watch a brown belt versus a white belt, you're going to see two kind of different things. But from a mentor or instructor standpoint, that's fine. What you should be seeing in both of them is they are trying to improve from where they are at to how they can be better. And the nice part about having them combined is that the white belt or the yellow belt or whatever can be watching the brown or black belt and saying, that's what it should look like. Like, I need to be moving like that. Um, but sometimes, and I, and I wanted to mention this too, that as an instructor, a mentor, if you're watching somebody, perhaps they're, they're a little clumsy, maybe they're struggling, but Brana said it, <clears throat> you can't expect perfection, realize they need to flush through a, quite a few reps before they start getting things down. Let them do it. Don't just flood them with input after input after input after every rep where they're kind of not right and you're just bombarding them with too much information. What's happening is, and this comes from a good place, the, the intention of wanting to teach a student and to get them to advance is is noble, but not giving them the, the air they need to in the space and time they need to practice and flush it out with their body. Let them do the reps. Uh, don't over flood them. But watch that they are trying to actually improve because there will be students, and this is kind of hits at the heart of this episode, who will go kind of go through the motions, but they won't really understand why or what they are doing. That's okay too. As much as we want to convey the 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 mental message or the the meaning, they may not be ready to absorb that either. Yeah, but that's okay. It, that takes time to absorb, just as it takes time for the feet to absorb how to, how they should be moving. Um, and that flooding can come in, and we talked about this in a recent episode, is of the overthinking. You can overthink yourself into not being able to to get good repetitions on what you want to work on. The same way that an instructor standing at you and flooding you with information isn't going to help the student either. Um, and so. I've found as, as an instructor, because I started out, you know, my, my teaching kind of started in the SCA, whereas I was trying to help other people. And I did, I was trying to do too much, tried to say too much, you know, tried to give everything that I knew away because I felt I was being generous. But the result was it was not cohesive or, or coherent. Um, the right, the correct few words will mean more than a whole ton of words that aren't that a student can't sort through um oh so, yeah you so, know and it, you know, that's interesting because you know um you and you bring that and you're 100 percent right um you can i i learned going into COVID. it also depends on the student so um mm -hmm. i was going through stuff even slower than i thought i would bring uh, other people through in the past and i ended up with a very frustrated student because they couldn't go from throwing a shot to moving and throwing that shot. Mm -hmm. And well, we don't talk about, Hey, here, throw this shot. Okay. Now just go ahead and fight and throw that shot. Mm -hmm. Right. So we yeah. literally had to break it down to now you're going to throw that shot going forward. And we, I've talked about this many times. Now you're going to throw that shot going at a different angle. Now we're going to, so we do all the different movements, throwing the same shot. And then I'm going to freeform the movement and you're just going to mimic me and throw that shot. And all of a sudden, and then I mean, like, now I'm going to not only freeform, but I'm going to start changing tempo in how fast I'm moving. Mm -hmm. And at the end of changing tempo and then throwing that shot in freeform, I was like, welcome to the fight. You're, you were just fighting. Mm -hmm. And because we took it one step at a time, it was understandable. Yeah, making instruction into edible chunks is a huge deal. Um, and that's, if you think about it, no matter where you are in terms of experience, if you look back at the things you learn, you, you can see how you had to kind of go in order and learn. And it may not be a total linear order. You may have kind of jumped off sideways. and But usually 
things that are more advanced are built on basics. And when you skip those basics, inevitably you have to go back to them. Yeah. Um, but I think, and I, and I was a victim of this myself, of the impatience of, okay, I want to, I want to jump farther ahead. You know, I want to, I want to really go far and quickly and, and I, I, you know, want it. I'd like to do be, be good at this now. I don't want to have to wait two, three, five years or 10 years to be decent. You know, you always want to, you have a certain level of ambition, a hunger. Um, and I would say this too, that from a mentor standpoint, if you look about it in terms of hunger, you can't sit down and throw a seven course meal in front of somebody and expect them to eat the whole thing in two minutes. Um, it takes one bite at a time to consume that meal. And if you looked at the knowledge that you're sharing as a mentor, picture handing somebody, you know, a plate of food, they have to be able to have time to eat it and consume yeah. it and internalize it. Yeah. It's um, interesting because Ron Valder posted, you know, I'm an overflutter mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and he knows too. He, uh, and I, I think the, the, the interesting point there is, um, I'm an overflutter as well. Um, mm -hmm. And I think yeah, the too. more somebody knows about something, the, sometimes the more excited they are about it. And th they want they want them to know it all. And mm -hmm. but you were 100 percent right. They're not they're not able to take that much in. And and mm -hmm. and the part I'm going to tell everybody is don't think that you're the only one that's like, OK, you just said three things and now I'm. You know, I'm swimming. I have no clue. I can't hold it all because, you know, there's been lots of cases uh, where, you know, you know, both me or Ron Walter were talking to, you know, on, it could even be another royal peer. And we're like, we're going through some stuff. And they're like, I'm done. I'm listening yeah. to those two things because everything else you're saying, I am overloaded, <laughs> mm -hmm. you know, yeah. and so, you know, and I think, I think that's where me and Ron Waller kind of learned that we're, we tend to flood people because we're so geared and locked into what we do. We want everybody to know every, here's how you turn your toe out mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> yeah, when you throw this shot, you know, mm -hmm. and, and you don't do that in the beginning. And yeah. uh, one thing I learned to do um, I, I is I watch and I try to watch and I try to ask. And in the end, I can, when I see it's, it's, this is when you're working with somebody or even yourself, first thing is you tell your mentor, your coach, whoever, it's like, okay, I got enough. Can we stay just on these three things? Or can we just stay on this one thing? Mm -hmm. Or, Hey, I am not getting it because we're back to communication. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. One of the, one of the common things that I would, I learned to jump in with was, I dig what you're telling me. Can, can I just do some reps on this for now? I just mm -hmm. need to rep this and burn it into the body. Um, and I, and I came across a, a phrase that I just loved and I so much. So I painted on the dojo wall, which was knowledge is rumor until it lives in the muscle yeah. and many martial artists, SCA people included love to sit and talk about technique, but it doesn't get burned into the muscle until you do the reps and you fit it into your fighting and that takes time to process that's that internalization part and i think a good mentor recognizes in a student when they're trying to process what they've heard trying to make sense of it and then they go through the process of trying to make their body do what they're picturing in their mind should happen and that all takes time that's that's them eating the meal um so let them eat it let them yeah. Let them chew on it. Let them swallow. Let them, you know, go on to the next bite. Um, it, it's it's if anybody remembers, it took everybody time, um, yeah. you know, and you you come across things which kind of cross wires with other things that you learned in the past, maybe a bad habit that you have that you have to now unlearn in order to absorb this thing you're working on. And so that's, that takes even more time when you start realizing, okay, well, how do, the, how do these pieces fit together? How does turning my toe like that affect other things that I'm used to doing that now I can't quite do and now I need to adjust? And uh, allowing that time, um, I think, is, it, it's, it's, it's crucial. It, it's, 
having your student do the processing work. That makes so, sense. so let's talk about, you know, in, in this case, we just talked about how we, you know, how we recognize a little bit in a student, giving a student time um, to, to make sure they feel and feel comfortable with the technique. Um, we, we, we talked about, you know, when maybe times to introduce new techniques a little bit, you know, depending on, mm -hmm. um, you know, you know, especially at the beginning, you know, here's don't keep them too bored too long, introduce something, go back to other things. All of those things are, are, are kind of the general of what people do now. Right. Mm -hmm. So, but let, let's take another example. How do we, you know, what happens to that student that, that you're watching and they're just they're, they're so frustrated with something they can't get that now you're losing them. You know, I tell you, I think, I let's, think let's talk about that yeah. first. It's like, Hey, I'm going to, I want to throw a wrap and, mm -hmm. and you, this, this student spends, you know, the, the next three, four, five weeks throwing a wrap and they just never get it. Mm -hmm. And they just never feel good about it. And now they're so locked in their head that they don't feel good about it. I, even if they throw it right, they probably still won't feel good about it. So sure. what do you do? What do you do about those people? Well, I think that the very first part, because you 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 will be fortunate to have a student who will come to you and say, "Here's what I want. I'm fr I'm frustrated," or "Here's here's what I want to have." Usually, they will kind of go along in silence. They'll follow. They'll do what they're told. But the first skill, and I think of a, of a mentor. And certainly any any fighter should have this and be able to recognize when they're frustrated from a from a coach standpoint you should be able to spot is this person bored are they restless are they frustrated are they they may not be saying uttering a word but you should be able to kind of read them and and get a feel for for where they're at do they feel overwhelmed are they confused um you know i can spot this from across the dojo floor easily when you know students are have, they've had too many reps now they're getting bored they're just going through the motions um or when somebody's really trying to make something work and uh because the way that 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 i normally teach is we work on a particular technique and we do reps for 10 15 minutes and then i stop and i show okay here's another technique that we can do but i won't stop those reps if i see students really trying to hash out the, the problems and trying to trying to improve themselves. But there gets to be that mental overload point where you do one thing long enough and your brain just kind of goes, OK, I'm I'm done with this. Maybe they improved some, maybe they didn't. But there comes a time when just pushing the same thing over and over again, it just isn't going to work. Well, or they get frustrated with it, right? Well, yeah, it's they either get bored, they get frustrated or distracted. Their mind wanders. Um, when somebody's shown something to work on, generally there's at least a period of time it might be five minutes or ten minutes kind of depends but their their brain starts to chew on it kind of like a dog you know playing with a ball and then he gets bored with it but make use of that time when when the student is chewing on the ball like they want to okay this is interesting right now um and when it starts to, to that starts to wane now it's time to introduce something else to that and that's the tricky part is some students go through that quicker than others, but learning as a coach to spot it, I think is a crucial skill. Um, and be able to, to either add something or modify something when, you know, for, the biggest one is when they get bored, when they start getting bored, now it's time to add something they need to do additionally. So I guess let's, let's, let's talk about that a little bit, you know, so we we're talking about the things we should watch as, good trainers and coaches uh, and the things that as a, as the person, the receiver of this should communicate to the others. And that is watch when you're just, you don't care if your technique is good or not anymore because you're bored. You're not watching what you're doing, be engaged. It's, it's, it's like throwing a weight up and not trying to isolate that muscle, right? It's you're just trying to get the weight up. Right. Mm -hmm. And um, so so be aware you when you get to that point, it's like, you know what? I'm not helping myself anymore. Mm -hmm. And then the second piece is be aware when you you think you're so frustrated because you're not doing it right that, you know, that you communicate that. And as a trainer, you you have to look and it's like, 
all right, at this point, I can tell they're frustrated enough. We need to move on. And I used to have to do that quite a bit. And it'd be like, I can tell this person's so frustrated about this one thing. They're not going to let it go. So by leaving it on the shelf for a while, I was like, you know what? Let's practice something you know how to do well. Mm-hmm. And what that does is they're like, oh, I do stuff well, <laughs> you know? And right. then right. and then they believe again and they're like, okay, I can go get that a try again. Mm-hmm. So so think about that as an instructor that don't take them from one hard thing to another hard thing because you may just keep increasing that frustration to the point where they walk away. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, or they just they just do it because you told them to. And that's even worse. Right. And so, the same holds true for the, the fighter themselves. Don't be so hard on yourself that you drive yourself to from one difficult thing to the next, constantly just heaping frustration upon frustration. They're this is SCA fighting. There's a time to go just fight and enjoy doing what you know how to do, even though in the back of your mind, you're saying, well, I want to do what I do better. Have some enjoyment time as well. And I think as a, as a coach, and this is something that does happen in martial arts a bit, especially martial arts that have sparring in them is you'll see in a student who avoids people that are at his or her skill level and above, and they will tend to, go do the sparring that's pretty easy for them to do. And you can, that to me is one of those indicators where um, if they do it way too much, um, you can kind of see that they want to coast. They're perhaps either not motivated, they might be a little lazy, or they might be just questioning their confidence uh, or exposing their lack of confidence. Um, And that's something that that a coach or instructor can do is to remind them and say, you know, it's cool that you want to practice with people that are nowhere near as experienced as you are. But just as a reminder, you're going to learn a lot from fighting and sparring with people that are above your skill level, maybe a little above, maybe quite a bit above, certainly quite a bit above, but the, that reminder to challenge themselves is going to be important. So remind yourself to challenge yourself. Don't let your, don't go into a practice and just work with all the new people constantly and never look at improving your own skill or challenging yourself. Um, And I I think the other piece is you have to challenge yourself, but you also have to put yourself in that place that you, that, that, so challenging yourself builds the, the, that, that focus to move forward, but it also can deteriorate your, uh, deter, it could essentially break down your confidence. So, Yes. Put yourself in those places as well where maybe you, you can be successful because mm-hmm. as much as technique is important, this is the part that doesn't get trained and that is confidence. Mm-hmm. And I'm going to tell you, they are both almost nearly as that you need both almost nearly as much because without confidence, you could be the best fighter in the world. And I guarantee you, you'll lose. Mm-hmm. Right. And so there are times when, you challenge yourself. I, I see this all the time. And I, I'm going to bring up a taboo subject here. But since it's our show, screw it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, and I think we've talked about it before. I, I see a lots of knights that go out and they want to help the under the, the, what they think is the underdog. They, they go out and they want to help a lady fighter who comes in and they want to you know, they want to make they want to make them successful because, well, in one way, we don't have a lot. And I think they really do want more women knights um, and, you know, any it doesn't matter what gender or whatever. You know, I know for me, you know, it's it's a scenario where there's also a little bit of a challenge there. It's like, OK, they're coming in with maybe softer skills than a, a, a guy who got you know, lots of sports in high school and all of those fundamentals who are a little easier. Um, And now you're like, hey, you know what? I get to work on somebody who really needs to do all of these things and grow. Um, But what happens is next thing you know, I see this all the time. And and I I specifically stay away from it uh, unless they ask. And that is I see a lineup of knights to fight this person. And that poor person's getting top fights and they're getting top information from 
tons of nights flooded and their confidence is shit because they've never won a fight mm -hmm. so it's much you know you get three nights in a row giving you three different things and you don't even feel like you're in the game fighting them you never really feel like you're in the game so be careful make sure if you're that person make sure that you spend time with your peers and what i mean that is that these people who are really close to your level and by the way when i say your peers those same people will be peers if they stay with it and they will pull you along right with them or you will pull them along with them so your peers are the are the people that knight you in the in the end right they're the ones that recognize you they're the ones that know what you've been doing um and they will they will be the ones that really uh bring you along um but you know not you know all these other people are really trying to help um but sometimes that help needs to be is like please go ahead and watch i'm gonna fight somebody that i fight all the time or that that is exactly my level that is my peer and i'm 50 50 with them because learning how to be 51 percent and 49 against that person is a huge step because you're learning to win mm -hmm. <laughs> you know All right so be yeah ready. and you're not doing it in, in such a scale where you are the 10 percent winner versus the 90 percent that mm -hmm. you know, somebody who's far above you um you know I, we, I remember the episode we talked about the um <clears throat> what is it building the 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 talent hotbed yeah it's when you get a, a core group, a small core group of those of the that same peer level where they're always trying to kind of nudge one another and one gets a little better and then the other one doesn't want to be the 49. So he, he, he or she jumps up. What happens is it doesn't seem in comparison that you're making a lot of progress, but the whole group rises in their skill. Um, and it, it it's a tremendous motivation it's far greater of a motivation than to be a new fighter with say in, in a group that's got a bunch of knights and that new person keeps showing up says someday i'm going to be able to be at this knight caliber fighter level they, they more than likely their path is going to be filled with demoralization um whereas that like you said that peer group thing that is pure joy it really is because it you're is. all sharing in the learning you're going through the crucible together and you know i know a lot of people will talk about the camaraderie of, of the chivalry and the knights where we can meet you know a, a fellow knight for the first time and we can sit down and usually have a beer and joke and laugh because we always we both realize we've been through a similar crucible even though we may have never have met but we've gone through a similar path but we've never gone through that exact path together. And that's, that's where that real bond is, is when those people are, you know, they come in about the same time, like you said, and uh, they come up together. I mean, that's tremendous. I still remember people in my peer group when I first started first authorized and, you know, the first few years, I mean, that was pure gold. Um, so, you know, on, on that point, I think it's important that the trainers and things like that, I know I ask for from my squires and and even well, every, in my head, everybody's a little bit my squire, but uh, everyone I train or ask to if they ask to be trained, I, I ask, I'm like, who are your peers? Who are your 50 50s? Mm -hmm. And, you know, and I make them write them down. And and then I ask, you know, after a little while, I'm like, are they still your 50 50? And they're like, well, you know, some people come and go. So sometimes you have to readjust that three. And then they're like, mm -hmm. okay, how are you fighting that person? And what I what, what that three gives them is people to hunt. You know, I tell them, go to them and say, guess what? Every place I go to, I'm going to fight you. Do you mind? <laughs> you mm -hmm. know? And, and then, you know, the goal is, okay, now I'm 60-40. Now I'm 70-30. Now I'm 80-20. Okay, now... He is no longer your 50 50 who replaces them mm -hmm. he's off the list are they or that that person's off the list who's your next person and they make them re-add somebody to that and soon those 50 50s become knights <laughs> it's like right. you know that newer knight or your 
your buddy who just got knighted, you know, who you're already doing 50 50 with. Now you're like, I don't care if he's knighted. I'm going to do 60 40. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm going to yeah. do 70 30. Mm -hmm. Right. And so I asked them to do that. I, and I think it's important for a trainer to find the times where somebody can be in that pure competition mode and not in a learning mode because that competition, we, this is one of those weaknesses in traditional martial arts is they don't have as much of a competition zone, right? right. Where mm -hmm. we absolutely have usually a 90% competition zone in a lot of mm -hmm. cases, but which is also a weakness, but that, that ability to compete is a whole new learning piece. So you have to allow and give people those competitions. It goes all the way back to, hey, here's a piece of foam, throw a shot at me when you first show up the first day, right? Mm -hmm. It's, hey, I like this. I like this adrenaline because that's what they're there for. So give them those opportunities. And that doesn't mean, oh, I'm going to hold back because they know you're holding back. Mm -hmm. That means you find somebody that that's or equal. And I'm going to tell you, there, there's like some, some people are like, Hey, this is my peer. And I'm like, they're not, they kick your ass all the time. Stop mm -hmm. looking at yourself so well. Sometimes you have to be straight up. He's like, right. you really think you're 50, 50 with that person. We're going to shoot some video and then we're going to review. Mm -hmm. Right. So yeah. truth is important in those spaces as well. And, and you can bring it better than what I just said. You can be like, well, I'm not sure you're 50, 50 with them. I think maybe they're holding back a little bit. So you may want to mm -hmm. make sure um, best way to make somebody not hang back, though, is, you know, become 60, 40. <laughs> right. <laughs> right? Yeah. Uh, and, and, and push that. But as a coach, trainer, mentor, you introduce people to those spaces because those are really important mm -hmm. because that's where confidence is built. That's where the headspace is built. There's technique and there's headspace mm -hmm. and both have to be. Both have to be learned, taught, and and you know, and and that's what people, you know, that's what a really good coach is for is building that headspace. So yeah. And one thing I want to jump in with, and that's an excellent point, which is, you know, of course we want to be careful that we're not as coaches being, you know, John Crease and having Johnny go sweep the leg on him. Um, of turning the I have to, I have to improve my win percentage to be to the point where it turns somebody into, you know scoundrel you can do that you can look at improving your performance in a very healthy way uh without it tainting your desire to win uh where it turns into you know cheating or uh, you're so you're so so eager to pursue the better numbers that you'll you'll uh push yourself the wrong way um but when it's done in the right way what you are granting somebody is the is the ambition or the opportunity to like you said when you, they go from 50 50 down to 40 60 when you improve to your 60 percent that's a motivational invitation that's mm -hmm. a hey you know join me up here you know yeah. let's see what you got and i to me i loved that i loved it when you know i had you know usually members of my household or other fighters from from elsewhere that we were you know friends and we even got to be friends because we were like that of the, you know, all right, I'm going to come up and I'm going to be at your level. And they enjoyed seeing me do that. And I enjoyed seeing them come up to my level and to be like, that's the, the brotherhood that we had was we were all interested in that same thing. It wasn't who was on top or who wasn't. It was, we all want to pursue one another. Um, and, you know, I, I I grant you that it's not to everybody's taste, but it is, in my opinion, it's tremendous. Um, there's, if you want to improve, you have to, you have to do something like that and enjoy it. Um, you know, I found some of the greatest uh, experiences were when somebody would invite me up to their level and yeah. And just give me tremendous feedback when I was either getting close or had gotten there or or surpassed it. Um, you know, there's little in life that was more rewarding than that experience um, because it was it was true um, caring to see somebody that you know ex express themselves like you did it. This is great. Like what you've done is fantastic. 
um, you know, there was nothing to taint that. So I'm going to, I'm going to pull, I'm going to show something and then I'm going to ask our producer to uh, come on the show because again, he is actually a teacher. So, and he had a, he had a really good post um, and uh, you know, about academic talking. And so uh, Silver, can you pop on? And uh, I'd like you to talk about that a little bit. I, I think that's important. I, I think, you know, this is what we're trying to do here. And this is the reason we talk a lot about technique and we talk a lot about uh, stuff that you could do as a fighter. Um, realistically, a lot of those things are a little outside what we started the channel for. Um, but we all love them and everybody, we want to make sure everybody's enjoying our channel as well. So we, we do those. But I, I think it's important uh, to talk to professional teachers too. I mean, it's the same reason Tristan's so important to the show is he has background in two things. And one is martial arts. He runs a studio. None of us do that. And uh, he has a he has a lot of background in there, so he, that's you know the one beautiful thing he brings, and um, and you know I love uh, Eli brings you know being a teacher in, and so do you. So I'd love to talk about this a little bit. Yeah, sure. Oh. So the uh, one of the things I I, I said I joke about the fact that uh, um, you need to tell people they, th what they know already when you start when you start working on something. You tell tell someone what they know. Because then they feel comfortable, they feel smart, they feel like they can learn, they feel like they can, they have a traction. Because if they don't have any traction, then they're they're going to say, "Well, um, well, this guy's just talking way over my head." I've I've gone to so we we typically in a lot of academic departments have seminars where people we bring in people from all over. They... Uh oh, so we yeah. bring him on and he freezes. How do you like that? Okay, you're back. Okay, I'm back now. So we, we have people who come in for seminars and they'll give an hour long talk and the absolute and they talk about their their absolute specialty, which is a niche academic thing. And uh, so if they lose you in the first two minutes, you're done. You're done. You you know no one they won't no one will pay attention to them for the whole hour. And they may be the smartest person in the world telling some of the most important stuff, but no one understands because they didn't never they felt like they didn't have any traction, they stopped. And then their brain shut off and they're, they're thinking about what they're, where they're going for their friends with dinner. Um, they're not thinking about the talk. Um, and then, so that same thing happens when we teach, like whether it's f fighting or whatever, if we start saying, Hey, you know, this is uh, either using language people don't understand or using, Oh you, yeah, you just do this Molinet and you've never shown them what a Molinet is. Then, you know, they feel, and you start there and you say, now we make it more complex. <laughs> yeah, you lost them right at the beginning. You lost them, and so like, I don't know what a mullet a is, and you're going advanced even farther. I'm like, okay, I'm done. Yeah. <laughs> no, and and I think I think that's important. I I really actually like that you bring it bring that up. Uh, the good part is that ties into the ability to to realize that you do your you know that traction piece is that part that we just talked about. In other words. You don't get a lot of traction when you're standing in front of uh, someone that's much better than you and you know they can rain down blows on you and and that. So, you you know, in the confidence end, you're not getting a lot of traction there. They can show you things. Um, so uh, that's good. But if 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 they just start straight out into that, then you know, you might not actually care enough. You, you might not have enough buy-in yet to actually learn. So a lot of times as somebody is much higher, what you want to do is, is let that person, I'm not saying let them hit you, let that person be free to throw stuff and, and get a smile at them and laugh with them so that they feel a connection and then compliment them on some things in that fight that they did do well. Because everybody, you know, you could have the worst fight in the, in the, in the world and it'd be like, the, you know, you, you move to your left really well, right? And then they're like, okay, I do. You know, I have something I do well. So now you're, you're in that space where you're like, let's talk about moving to the left. And maybe things that you can do from moving to your right and change them to your left. And that way you're adding another layer as a good teacher that, that builds, I think that Severid, I think that builds that place where you're like, I'm in, I understand, right? I already do this, but I only do it to the right. <laughs> you know? And, 
And that, that buys that, that, that I want to learn more piece. But if you just, you know, go out there and you hammer somebody down and dege they're dejected, do you think that person is really going to learn? Yeah, they they gave up after the second minute. Right. <laughs> so um, I, I think it's important that everybody understands, you know, that uh, uh, you're, you're in that space uh, where it's our responsibility to to make sure that they do want to learn. And it's not just martial arts and, and SCA martial art, and, but it's also academia, right? It's, 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 it's fundamental teaching of people. Yep. So mm -hmm. I, I think that's super important. Um, and I think that goes right into the point that we we're talking about on this piece. And that is people getting bored. Okay. People, you know, people not believing. So not, i.e this is so above my head or I, I, I just don't think I can learn this people getting frustrated, right? Oh, well, I can't win because well, everyone I fight is better than me. <laughs> right. So you have to look at those pieces and figure out how to get your, you know, now your job as a teacher is how do I get that person to believe the other end of that is that I am good. I, I, I may be frustrated with these things, but I do other things well. And, you know, and I'm good with going back and trying to learn this again type of deal. So, um, and, and I want to listen and I want to learn. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I think that fits in that space that we were just talking about, Tristan. I think, uh, you know, probably for you, 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 you get to that space where maybe somebody's trying a certain technique and they just, they just don't f ever feel good about it. You know, one of the, and I ran across, this is a, kind of a, a good sideline story, but it, it drives this point home. Um, a few years ago, I hosted a, uh, I did this for a number of years, but I hosted one in one in particular. It was a, a martial arts meetup group here in the Twin Cities. And we got a bunch of people together and the, we did this particular theme where we'd say, all right, we'd have martial artists from different arts come in and we'd, pick a theme where it, like somebody from this one particular art would come in and say, all right, why don't you show everybody the fundamentals of, of what your art is? Like what somebody who's never been exposed to say Krav Maga or Wing Chun or, you know, whatever. It's like, you're going to have a half hour, go over whatever you want to cover that you're showing us what your art does. And we, we, we did this with about, I don't know, a few different instructors. And I've seen this happen all over the place too, as, as they would sit in there for like two weeks, like, how am I going to show my whole art in half an hour? And they'd come and they, they'd all, they'd almost do the exact same thing. They'd walk in and say, well, the most important thing is how you, how you move, how you walk and how you breathe. So for a half an hour, we were breathing and walking. And it struck me as hilarious because of a couple of things and that, that apply to what we're talking about. Yes. Breathing is tremendously important to, to fighting. Don't think for a second you're going to teach brand new people how to breathe. While <laughs> no. Correct. That just is not going to happen. As much as you think in your mind, this is crucial. Like you have to, if you're holding your breath and throwing blow, you just cannot, you're not going to be good. But it takes a, a lot of prerequisite knowledge before you can start to integrate breathing with technique. Yes. And it doesn't matter what martial art you're doing. And SCA fighting is no different. So even though it is absolutely true that breathing is crucial to, to fighting in the martial arts, understand you're not going to force it from day one. And if you try to do it, I guarantee you, you will bore the crap out of anybody, of new people standing and breathing and walking across a field back and forth for an hour and a half. It yep. just, and that's to me, the perfect example of, be patient. Somebody might be holding their breath and throwing shots or trying to move there. That's not what they're working on. And that, that shouldn't be what they're working on. If, if they're at a level where just moving their feet around is a challenge, like let them figure that challenge out. Don't, don't be too worried about the holding the breath or breathing incorrectly or whatever. So um, that's what I found. And I, once I saw that and I went back and I looked at martial art development period it all had that same feel to it like don't force the thing that's not they're not turning on at that moment 
um, or at their level of development. Um, you're just gonna, it'll be wasted words to point out something they're not even ready to start to integrate. Um, if that makes sense. No, I think that's a great point. And, and, and I find it interesting that all of them came and we're talking about breathing and moving. Oh yeah, walking. every single one, yep. And, and you really, when you hit the top ends of something, those actually do become super. Oh, they are absolutely. And but it you also what? shows that most was what's on nothing. their mind. Yes, when, but when most of them have nothing it. to do with when you start. Right. Exactly. <laughs> and but and that's I guess from what I was mentioning earlier is, or maybe I didn't mention this. I know we were talked about it before the show. When you are an instructor, you're a teacher. You're going to show up, and you've suddenly got these students in front of you. The most tempting thing is to go on what's what you're working on and say, all right, this has been what's going on in my mind. Here you go. Now, if you don't know where you're where the students are and what they're processing, you're probably just going to go right over their head. They don't even know what you're, you know, what you're talking about. And so even though you've been churning on that concept, maybe for weeks or months, trying to work it into your fighting you might be completely talking entirely past your audience. Um, and that's where a, a good coach has to shift gears. A coach who is a, a practitioner has to shift gears from what they're working on to, okay, what are you guys working on? What's what's gonna be something that's gonna resonate with, with you and not go either over your head or underneath it, showing them something that's so simple that they already know how to do it. And they're um, bored. Yep. And they're bored. Yeah, exactly. And that's where reading your students is, I think, a crucial skill. Um, you know, give them something that they're interesting, that they're that they're ready to eat. Ready uh, you to know, I guess here's here's, you know, we, we, we've been talking a lot about, you know, recognizing some places, you know, a coach recognizing places that you, you could be losing a student in through frustration, boredom, all of those pieces. Um, I'm going to throw this out to both of you. How, how does, how does student do it? Right. You know, because sometimes we don't recognize, you know, we'll sit in frustration as long as it takes. I mean, we mm -hmm. love being frustrated, right? I mean, we just, I'm going to get this to work <laughs> until I quit. <laughs> right. Right. And that's so, usually the curve. <laughs> so, you know, is there a mechanism? Do we review something? Do we watch video? Do we write it down in a book? As as the student or as the fighter, and I don't maybe have a teacher or whatever, how do I recognize I'm stuck in one of those places? Hmm. I think that's a good question. And uh, and going, and, and this is where SC, the SCA has actually got the great um, competition venue for you to take stock of where you're at where you can find your deficiencies they'll usually stand out to you although it's it's easy to get in that point where like let's say you're a pretty hot unbelt level fighter and you have the choice really the you've got the most options you can either go up the food chain and challenge yourself and maybe get frustrated and and upset that you know you're you're uh being over challenged or you can kind of fight down to people that are less experienced and coast and sort of enjoy you know uh your skill where you're not challenging yourself um and i think that there's the to realize i guess maybe the the way you phrase your question strikes me how do i know if i'm on a plateau like i'm yeah trying I mean, to really that's what it kind of comes where to i'm at and i'm i'm mired down and uh, my uh, my key for for the 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 plateaus was I don't see anything changing. The, the same the problems I have now are the same problems I had six months ago, and I've not I haven't it hasn't dawned on me how to fix them. Um, of course, I did a lot of a lot of most of my development work was kind of out here in the hinterlands at the time, and um, you know so it was a lot of DIY you know coaching, um, but. It, it wound up being when you run into the same problems consistently, that indicates a plateau when you're working on something that doesn't seem to be advancing. And I think that's where a lot of frustration comes from where, you know, maybe you came up with a harebrained scheme for how to fix what it is was going wrong with your fight. Um, 
you're trying things that that just aren't working and you you're not getting that brainstorm idea of hey i think this will fix the problem um i've found that kind of setting that down and, and shift like you said earlier shifting to something else maybe a different weapon style um or, or go to a different teacher or watch yeah, some videos yeah, or yeah change, change your environment a little bit um and frankly that could be frustration in dealing with the same opponents that that beat you consistently yeah and go somewhere different yeah, you haven't figured out how to beat them it doesn't mean just keep going and fighting them until eventually you do because like you said you run into that wall where, where you think eh, maybe i'll skip practice tonight because that's all, I, all i'm going to be is frustrated and i don't want to do that tonight i'd rather eat a pizza so um you know that the frustration was one is one place to to spot it but once you spot it and you can usually feel it like it's not it's fairly obvious the th then the thing is what to do about it and i and i like what you talked about which was you know change your change something that you're doing rather significantly um and if you do need to take a break take a break because here's yeah. the one thing the more you press yourself mentally the harder it is to have good ideas you have the best ideas when you're more relaxed you don't have the pressure on whether it's an external or an internal pressure you think better when you're not constantly riding yourself or why aren't you better why didn't you figure this out this isn't a you know it's easy to beat yourself up um but it's not productive yeah and the, and the worst part is you know sometimes we're hard on ourselves and and that is part of the path as well right i mean you know yeah you can't learn, not have ambition right we learn to endure right and and mm -hmm. that you you push yourself in in hard places and we learn to deal with it and we keep pushing ourselves harder and harder and we keep learning to deal with it that's it's all about becoming something more is this their their hard work gets you to the end and that's just just fundamental um Sivir, on a teaching end of that, you know, I guess, you know, how do you recognize that maybe you're stuck on a subject and and you're not advancing? Well, I, I'll start at a student end. Sometimes it's that, you know, so I, I know that I, you know, when I'm fighting and I'm, I know that I'm running into issues. Like, I think it's funny that Tristan brought up breath because that's what I'm struggling with right now. And, you know, I recognize that I'm running out of breath. And so then I go back and I think, you know, your, your, your idea of, well, how do you address that? Well, I work with it at practice intentionally for a certain amount of time, but I sure can't spend the whole practice time spending it on it. Cause then I just get pissed off with myself cause I'm not doing it right. But then going back and looking at videos, going back and looking at other materials to get myself a different point of view really helps. And I, I think for students from a, from a teacher point of view, sometimes you see the student is just just not getting an idea. And for me, sometimes the best thing to do is just come up with some other resource, whether that's another person, whether that's a video, whether that's a, you know, some sort of, sometimes it's just a story, you know, on uh, the, the person again, or sometimes it's just stepping back and going to the previous fundamental and saying, okay, you know how to do this, right? Now let's, you know, build up some steam and some traction and go back forward again. Because, Again, it's back to the, you know, they know what they, they know, they're not incompetent, you know, they're, they're good students. They just don't necessarily, this one piece is slipping. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And for what it's worth, Sivan, in almost 20 years of, of Aikido, which I started after about 25 years of SCA fighting, I've yet to see anybody short of brown belt level start to integrate breath, breathing into yeah. their technique. Yeah. Never. Like in fact, I, there are so many people I there there's a lifetime of people that are even royal peers that have really not understood how to integrate breath right i mean mm -hmm. that's that's a a solidly really hard, advanced almost concept. mastery when you're into that space and to get to mastery is not a super easy thing mm -hmm. absolutely now so. it doesn't mean as a teacher and i'm gonna sideball this i uh when we were doing the footwork drills i, I found that i introduced the way i introduced things like that was at practices i'd be like okay you're doing something you know how to do i want everybody to close their eyes mm -hmm. and i want you to just concentrate on doing the drill with your eyes closed it, now that wasn't about breath but then i had one exercise that i was like okay every time you go outside the ladder i want you to breathe out 
And that way you started understanding. And what I wanted people to do is closing your eyes allowed all the input from outside to go away and allowed you to relax and be in it, um, almost a meditation space. And you just give them the easy ways to be at the front of what they're trying to learn. I didn't dive in deep. I just like, I, this is what I want you to do. Hey, you remember last week when we did breathing on this? So you're going to keep breathing and you're going to add this to it. Right. And, and I just help remind people of what we were doing the simple ways. Uh, and then at the end of the session, instead of bombarding everybody with a million things in those sessions, I would bombard them with a little bit and then, you know, and did the exercise for the day. And then I'm like, everybody, we're going to be going through these things next week, by the way. And this is what they're about. And that way, when they're all like, oh, my God, how do we do that? And freaking out. They got a week to think about it. And the time they hit that practice, they're again, it's like, well, I'm not going to freak out. I'm not freaking out anymore. I, 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 so we're supposed to do this. Let's go ahead and do this. So, you know, sometimes introducing things that are strange to people that they that they've never done that may be way outside of even what they're ready for a way to do that is make sure that you introduce it to them don't force them to do it just introduce it so that they can sit on it and think about it for a time because then when they go to do it it's not a shock and they're willing to listen mm -hmm. and they actually had a week to think about it and why they may want to do that, why it's important. They had all of that thinking time, not doing time, but thinking time of why do I have to learn to breathe? It's like, well, I don't breathe very well when I'm fighting. So maybe I should try this, <laughs> you know? Mm -hmm. So just be aware there's ways to teach. This is a sidebar on our conversation, but um, sure. there's ways to teach advanced skills. You just, if, if you dive in with every detail, you know, you're probably not going to get there. You're going to lose them fast. So, and, yeah, and I, I want to follow up on that one because that's, that is a great point of, so when you have a student who's at a certain level and you know that there's some concepts coming up that they're going to be learning, they're not ready to process them. Now, what you talked about is perfectly fitting where you open a door for them by planting an idea in their head. You tell them, okay, you should be integrating, you know, your breath with techniques, but let's not worry about that right now. But in mentioning that their brain goes, wait a second, I should, maybe I should, I, I should be doing this. And this explains how a teacher or an instructor or a coach can tell somebody, you know, here's what, here's what you need to be doing. And they'll tell them for two, three years. And then one day they'll go, I finally get that. I get why you've been telling me this for two or three years. You're planting the seed is what you're doing. That's um, exactly it. Don't, don't think of it like a, here's the next page out of the manual that you need to memorize and just give them page and then page and then page. It's a, you're going to give them a number of different concepts and they will absorb them when they are ready. And that kind of speaks to the patience thing that we were talking about earlier in terms of being a mentor of you don't want to withhold information that they're, that they need to have but you can't flood them either. Right. And, and it, it's kind of an art form really of, of <laughs> when, when you give students kind of what they need, they pick from what they can use and they leave stuff behind and you have to see them leave a few of those things and not deal with them right then. And yeah. Say, You'll get to them eventually. And if you hear about them enough, when the opportunity comes that you can, that you can internalize it, it'll be there waiting for you. And then boom, it, it hits. Um, yeah. And they're not shocked. Right. So no, it's like, they're not, they're not you know shocked. What? I'm not fact, ready to learn this. You've I don't... been mentioning this to me forever. And now I'm. Yes. <laughs> exactly. Yep. Yep. Yeah. And, and I'll know. say, this, I do the same thing, you know, when, when you look at, and students hate it because for, for in academics, when you say a student, hey, go read this chapter before we start about talking about it. It's not that we want people to learn and everything from the chapter. We just want to say, hey, I've looked at some of these words and I know what they mean. And now I'm ready to actually start learning. It's not that I expect them to go off and learn by themselves. It's I want them to be ready and prepared and mind open, ready to learn rather than uh, stuck on what they were doing before the, the last time we had a class. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
Yeah, I mean, and and that's I think that's a that's a really huge thing. So you know, I think we've been talking about people that um, you know we're, we're trying to help everybody recognize some of those things. You have to be careful about being too hard on yourself. I'm talking to somebody on the sidebar on and and have been talking to them about. You know, I'm a big believer in uh, in the fundamental of if you want to be good at something, you got to put it lots of hard, hard, hard work. And to be confident about something, you have to recognize the work you put in. In other words, your foundation of confidence is that you have done it, that you have pushed yourself, right? Um, mm -hmm. Doesn't work for everybody that way. That foundation may have to come a different way. Uh, and that goes back to maybe you fight those 50-50 people and you, and you start passing people up. You're like, oh, I'm better now. You have to be careful that... And, and it's okay later, you will do this no matter what. But you have to be careful. It's like, well, you know, I'm never as good as this next guy. You're right. You're never as good as the next guy that's above you. And in the end, you'll appreciate it. And sometimes on the way there, if you're looking always there, then you're never as good. And, and you start getting that in your head. Later on, you never want to be as good because you want to keep learning. <laughs> so there's two different spaces in that kind that that you know that phrase and you have to beware i guarantee you ron Galder and myself we're like you know what one day i'll be a good fighter but that guy right now is fucking awesome you know mm -hmm. and i got to get some fights to see if i even compete and you know and we appreciate that because we're trying to get better um but when you're a lower end fighter and you're like well you, you discount the fights that you have good fights and I may, you, know, you, you could have a good fight and still be 2080 by the way. Um, but if you discount all the good things you do and you're always looking at the guy up next, he's like, well, I'm not as good at him. So I'm never going to be as good. Well, mm -hmm. you're destroying yourself. So you're destroying the, your ability to learn. So, so be aware of that. One thing I'd like to follow that up with is also you can get granular about learning things from other people. For example, you see a, a fellow fighter say, boy, they've got a great offside shot. I'd love to have an offside that is as good as theirs. Or they do a great you know, lateral step. Um, they have some, some aspect of their fight. You just want to take that thing rather than saying, all right, win percentage. You know, to me, that was... You can use it, but I found a, a great amount of interest. It sparked a lot of my imagination to say, wow, what does this person do really well that I'd like to be able to do? And sometimes you can you can integrate that, you know, train it, try to work on it, integrate it into your fight. Sometimes it doesn't work out, but it's worth trying. It's worth uh, exploring uh, when somebody else has, you know, particular skills that that you'd like to have. Um, you know, I, I was a, a pretty solid thief. I, I love stealing things from all kinds of different people when I could see, you know, something that I felt that I could integrate into my fight or even just experiment with. Um, yeah, some turned out to be turkeys and they didn't work out so well. And maybe it was I was not ready to learn them at that point. Or maybe I just did not have the right physical or mental traits that they did to make their approach work. Um, but I did find those both with the, the physical stuff as well as the mental part. Um, there were fighters that I looked around who I saw how patient they were. And I'm like, that's pretty cool. How about I work on patience in my fighting um, and explore that part? So there was more mental exploration as, as much as physical ones. Um, and then there were you know times where I, boy, this the person's footwork is just amazing. I want to I want to work on some footwork like that. How about I try it and see how that goes? Um, these are all things, because we were talking about earlier, what do you shift to when you get frustrated in doing one thing? There are a lot of ways to find inspiration to say, all right, I'm going to set down the thing that's frustrating me. How about I find something else to play with for a little while and see what can come of it? And then when you maybe that goes, you know, goes its route, and then you come back and say, all right, okay, I, I, this frustrated me a few months ago. I'm going to come back and revisit it look at it with fresh eyes. And a lot of times you can break through a plateau or your frustration and you have some new skills that you usually can bring to the table that may turn it around and make that thing that was frustrating you work out. 
so oh man i just had it and i'm, I'm losing it um i'm gonna have to i'm gonna have to that's all right that. that's all right um i was just gonna ask another question and then i was like ah damn it i lost it yeah. um so oh i know what the question was what happens when you're good enough what's such a thing as good enough ah and that's i literally that's why i asked that question what happens yeah. when you're good enough Severid, what happens when you're good enough when you when you think you're good enough at a subject um i usually find out that i'm just learning <laughs> right well and, it's and, kind of funny you think you, you think i find you know you talk to someone who's just finished just defended their master's thesis or just defended their phd and they're like yeah i finally i'm i'm hit to the point where uh things are you know i'm doing things right yeah. and then all, all of a sudden you're you know you're shut down you <laughs> we're all switching back and here. forth well let's yeah <laughs> yeah so you figure out which one's supposed to everyone. be everyone's uh, you, you start off and you say okay you're supposed to be the expert in your field and then all of a sudden you realize that you may be the expert in your very teeny field but there's a much bigger field out there that you're part of that you need to be learning about and it's the same thing i think in fighting you may have even if you've gotten something that you think is perfected or really good, there's always other places that, that, you know, someone's going to be beat you or being better than. So, <laughs> so, you know, the reason why I asked that question is I will, I will tell you exactly what happens when you think you are good enough. And, and what happens when you think you're good enough is that is when you start declining. Any living because thing is either growing or it's dying. You you got it. And and that means, and I'm not talking about it's like, oh, well, then I got to go learn something else. No, you don't. I mean, what you have to do is make sure the things you're doing are still perfect. Because the things you do will break down too. We spend, I spend more time, you know, uh, on my own and and Ron Valdez spends more time on and, and working on things that we know how to do than, than new things that we're trying to learn. Mm -hmm. So, so I guess the, maybe the last subject of this is, oh, well, I'm there, right? And maybe, so it, I'm not struggling anymore. I'm not, you know, I, I, I'm not frustrated anymore. I'm, I'm, I, I don't have to worry about the 50, 50 anymore. I don't have to do any of those things. I feel good enough about myself. And that is. Be careful. That's probably the worst place to be. Because like Tristan said, either you're learning or you're dying. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I, I think that was an important part of the, the conversation about learning new things and when is it time? So this is, you know, this is the idea is there's, there's no time when it, when you shouldn't be learning. So this is one of those places where you have to think about that as well. Yeah, to me, learning was always a joy. And yes, sometimes frustrating. But getting to absorb new skills and to be better and to see yourself getting better, there, to me, that was a very pleasurable experience. It is a pleasurable experience. To give that up, I, that just doesn't compute to me. Um, to say, you know, I'm a master of, of all and... You know, for one thing, it'd be quite an ego that would take to take to say that. But to your question is, are you, you know, am I good enough? Am, or am I skilled enough that I, I'm at the level I want to be? And then that's that's it. Every time I've, I've seen somebody hit that wall, usually they quit or they go on to find something else or they just wither and disappear. And that's it. Like they it's almost like they lose an ambition for life. Yeah, uh, which, which is very sad, um, you know, and there's nothing wrong to say, well, I'm, I've gone as far as I want to go to and go through in this activity. That's fine to, you know, and usually their ambition yeah. shifts to other things that, you know, that's cool. And it happens. There's, you know, nothing wrong with that. But you can't say that, you know, everything there is to know about it. That's just. I mean, nope. that, that sort of reflects like you want to tell yourself that you've mastered something or that you're you've and, gone as, and, as far as, as any human could go. But and that cracks lie. me up because because we have masters in martial arts. And the first thing they will always say is they have never mastered anything. 
right? right. Because they're yep. always continuing mm -hmm. to learn. Yeah. And the yeah. one that really gets me is when people title themselves grandmaster or they, they even allow that title. Like, okay. <laughs> yeah, I know. It, whatever it, whatever it, takes to have you feel good about yourself, I guess, is. Yeah. Cool. And, and it's funny. I mean, you know, that sometimes the title comes on from other people and, and oh, yeah. you're master because that's the way they see you. And, and you mm -hmm. see yourself as still at the beginning. <laughs> right. 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 All yeah. the way to the end. <laughs> mm -hmm. all right and uh and and you can be a master that way and, and realistically you probably are you you may know more than almost anybody about certain things that you do but it's it's always changing you know einstein thought you know that uh that lots of physical things were stupid and he was totally fucking wrong <laughs> so you know it, it doesn't mean that you can stop learning and to, and to hook this this subject right up to our the purpose of this whole podcast was if you as a coach or a mentor ever hear somebody say that they're not ready they're not ready to learn anything that's that's a you know that's a full cup that you're never going to put anything else into and um, you know you probably see this I've run into it you know in my dojo I've had people come in and say well you know I've studied this and I know how to do that and blah blah blah. <laughs> And they you know, must make themselves feel good telling themselves that or telling you that. But like, yeah. well, I, there's nothing, not really much room for anything else if you kind of know everything. That's so. that's funny because uh, that, that I was just I'm going through the uh, uh, I'm going through a, a really interesting book right now, and they they talk a story, and it's not the only book I've heard this in. But you know, a master is sitting there with a new student. And, and that new student is telling us like, oh, this is what I've done. And this is what I've done. And this is what I've done. And he's going through everything he's done. And, and, and the master's like, okay. And he's like, so what do you have for me? He's like, and he takes his teacup out and he starts pouring. And he keeps pouring and he starts pouring all over the floor. And he keeps pouring and he keeps pouring and he stops. And the guy's like, what are you doing? You know? And he's like, well, Sometimes you have to make sure that you empty some of the from the cup before you keep taking it. Yeah, <laughs> classic martial arts fable story. Yeah, terrible. I mean, classic. right. And that's when somebody says their cup's full. That's exactly what they mean. Is yeah, they they come in with so much stuff in their head they they can't open anything up to get more more in. Exactly. Um, yeah. So. All right. Well, I think uh, I think well, it's, it's, it, we got a little bit more time. If anybody has any questions, please throw them out there real quick. Uh, mm -hmm. Meanwhile, I think what we'll do is uh, I, I will first say thanks both you guys for uh, talking a subject that I you know I didn't have anything to talk about at the beginning of the subject, and uh, uh, I really enjoyed the whole conversation. So I hope uh, I hope everyone else online did because I know I did, and, um, mm -hmm. uh, and I hope uh, I hope people got a chance to think about themselves and, and their learning progress. And I hope teachers and trainers got a chance to think about that. They, they have to spend time and interact with their students and, and recognize those times to engage them before you try to push something onto them uh, and recognize when that disengagement occurs and, and when that frustration occurs and all of those pieces, because they're super important. Um, but uh, I'm happy we had a chance to talk about it. I was I wasn't sure we were going to fill an episode with this. So, I, but I guess we did. Uh, and uh, Severin, thanks for jumping on with us. Uh, I really like bringing the teacher part into that because it shows that this is all learning. It, it doesn't matter what type of learning; it's learning. I don't care if you're learning physics. I don't care if you're learning physics of your body. It, it's it's learning, right? So. Um, uh, I, uh, I think it's important that we help people be better teachers and be better students. And I'm hoping that the, we got done tonight. So, uh, I, I don't see any big questions out there. Uh, so what we'll do is, uh, what do we got next week? Uh, Tristan. Uh, looks like we're doing heroes and traditions of Kaid. Uh, and I think Duke Alanon is going to be leading that up as usual. Uh, should have some good, interesting guests on there and it should be a good show. Yeah, yeah, I agree. And uh, it'd be nice to have him back. I haven't seen Alan on a little bit, so it'd be nice to see him and and Brennan and um, 
uh, it's uh, it, and and it's interesting because those are always actually kind of cool shows. Uh, we're talking about possibly adding. Uh, so for everybody knows, uh, first thing I want to thank everybody for uh, Sean put something out, and then I put something out just mostly about this episode. But we get some great ideas for future episodes, which really helps us from all the stuff that people posted in the last week. And, uh, uh, you know, we're going to burn through all of that and put that in our like, hey, here's some other ideas to talk about. And uh, or here's some idea. Here's some episodes that people would like more talk about. And we're going to try to make sure we get those to you. Um, so thanks for that. And uh, otherwise, I think uh, I think it's been a great night. I want to thank you too, and uh, and we got our fun caption on the bottom. Sometimes it's, 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 some people recognize stuff in there later on as it goes through, and <laughs> uh, <laughs> but in, in the end, uh, you know what? Just keep training, um, keep learning, because I'm going to tell you, a life of learning is a is a good life. So uh, keep at it, and uh, a life of helping others learn is probably even better. So. Thanks both. Yeah. And thanks everybody in the audience that came out and listened to us. And uh, we, uh, we uh, hope to see you online. Uh, remember our, all our YouTube videos are out there as well. Uh, you can review any of those anytime and uh, uh, keep it up and we'll see you soon. Have a good night, everybody. Good weekend. Have a good night, everyone. Good night. <laughs>